Hello, all you happy people, and welcome to Cinematic Excrement. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. Now, never fear, next time we shall return to our regular ranting and raving about a horrible movie. Probably starring Adam Sandler. But this time, we're going to focus on a certain type of film. One that is rather prevalent, rather polarizing, and rather unorthodox. As you no doubt have guessed, because you have eyes and you saw the title of the video, I am, of course, speaking of found footage. Some people love it for its raw, realistic, pseudo-documentary-style presentation. The idea that we're watching someone's video diary of events that actually happened. Others hate it for its cheap appearance and the idea that we're basically paying 15 bucks to watch someone's home movies. Of course, this style of storytelling isn't anything new and even predates film. You could trace it all the way back to epistolary novels like Bram Stoker's Dracula and Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which tell their stories as historical accounts through letters, journal entries, and the like. In the world of film, found footage got its start back in 1980 with Ruggiero Deodato's Cannibal Holocaust, which shows the lost footage of a documentary film crew that went to the Amazon to film cannibal tribes and were never seen again. It's not 100% a found footage movie, at least not what we'd consider found footage today. Rather, the documentary footage is used as a form of flashback. Cannibal Holocaust was a pretty controversial film at the time, and was banned in several countries, including Deodata's home country of Italy, due to its depictions of graphic violence. So graphic, in fact, that some people who saw the movie actually thought they were watching a snuff film. I suppose in a certain sense they were. The movie does depict the legitimate killing of several animals, which is one reason why I'm not a fan of this film, and Deodata himself later came to regret including the animals in the movie. But no humans were actually harmed in the making of the film. Nevertheless, some viewers really thought the human actors were legitimately killed in the film. This was a great enough concern that Deodata was, and I am not making this up, charged with murder by the Italian authorities, and he had to demonstrate for the courts the special effects that went into several of the film's death scenes. He even had to bring in several of the actors from the film to prove that they were, in fact, not dead. It was a different time. While Cannibal Holocaust may have given birth to found footage filmmaking, the movie that is largely credited with popularizing the found footage style is, of course, 1999's The Blair Witch Project, the story of three film students who traveled to Burkittsville, Maryland to film a documentary about the mythical Blair Witch and were never seen again. I'm sensing a theme here. One year later, their footage was found. Unlike Cannibal Holocaust, the entire movie consists of footage shot by the three missing students, so everything that happens is seen directly from their point of view, creating a rather interesting movie-watching experience. Despite considerable critical acclaim, audience reactions were mixed. Some found it spooky, and some found it lame. I personally liked it a lot, but I totally understand why a lot of people would not. It's a very different style of filmmaking, and it's not going to appeal to everyone. But despite the mixed reaction, it went on to make almost $250 million against a $60,000 budget. Even when you adjust for inflation, that's still not even six figures in today's money. Artisan Entertainment bought the distribution rights for just over $1 million. Needless to say, they pretty much won the lottery. While the Blair Witch Project is largely credited with popularizing found footage, I'm not entirely certain it deserves that distinction. It may have been the first such movie to achieve blockbuster status, but found footage didn't really become mainstream until almost a decade later with movies like Cloverfield and Paranormal Activity, both distributed by Paramount, oddly enough. This was the beginning of a boom period of sorts for found footage, and since then we've seen more of these types of movies than I care to count, including Unfriended, As Above So Below, The Visit, Wreck and its American remake Quarantine, VHS, and the various sequels and knockoffs these movies have spawned. Hell, there are six Paranormal Activity movies to date. Seven if you count Tokyo Night. Most of these films tend to be in the horror genre, of course, but once in a while they show up in other genres as well, like Chronicle or Into the Storm. While there was a time when it seemed like you couldn't go more than two months without another found footage movie hitting theaters, or at least going direct to video, it seems like it has finally lost some steam. But it hasn't completely gone away. 
they did recently film a sequel to Unfriended, unfortunately, which will probably be released sometime next year. And it most likely never will go away entirely for one very simple reason. Money. By and large, these movies are incredibly cheap to produce. There are occasional exceptions, like Into the Storm, which cost $50 million due to being unusually effects-heavy for a found footage film. But most of their production budgets don't get past the low seven figures. Some don't get past five. The first Paranormal Activity movie cost $15,000. 15,000. My car costs more than that movie. And with budgets so low, they're almost guaranteed to turn a profit even if they don't do that well at the box office. So basically, Hollywood figured out the Asylum's business model. If your movie is cheap enough, you'll probably get a decent ROI. And you know what else found footage movies have in common aside from their low budgets? They tend to suck. Come on, who are we kidding? I say this as someone who actually likes the found footage style. While there are a few gems here and there, most of these movies range from mediocre to crap. Why else would I be talking about them? This show is called Cinematic Excrement after all. And it's not just because they look cheap. The idea behind these movies is the footage is typically shot by amateurs. When I'm watching home movies or a student's documentary, I don't expect Star Wars. But a movie can look cheap and still be entertaining just as a movie can look expensive and be a complete mess. <clears throat> but many found footage movies tend to be of fairly low quality. They certainly don't have to be. It is entirely possible to make a found footage movie that's actually good, but so many of them fall into the exact same traps. And if filmmakers are content to continue to give us these found footage movies, it sure would be nice if they could avoid these pitfalls. And I'm not talking about things like bad acting, inconsistent tone, poor pacing, etc. It's true that you tend to see those sorts of things in found footage movies, but they're hardly exclusive to that type of filmmaking. You see that shit in every style, every genre, and every budget. I'm talking about the problems that are inherently part of the found footage style. For starters, you ever notice how some found footage movies tend to forget that they are found footage movies? This tends to happen more frequently with the more mainstream found footage movies than their lower budget independent brethren. And I understand why. As a director, when you've been making normal movies, for lack of a better term, for years, it's hard to do something in such a vastly different style. Old habits die hard, after all. And you inevitably fail to suppress those instincts and end up making a normal movie instead of the found footage movie you were supposed to be making. Or at least you stray off the path now and then, even if you do find your way back. I think part of the problem comes from the tendency to make the cameraman an actual, you know, cameraman. Now, sometimes this can work if the character that operates the camera is supposed to be a professional camera operator. Or in the case of Chronicle, if the camera operator is telekinetic. But often, having an amateur operate the camera can give the film a feeling of authenticity that a professional cannot. This is one thing that worked in the Blair Witch Project's favor, and my god, I am so sick of having to say the full title of that movie every time. I'm sorry, I know this is a stupid-ass thing to complain about, so feel free to tune out the next 30 seconds or so, but god, I was so used to just being able to abbreviate that movie as Blair Witch. If I made this video two years ago, all I'd have to say is Blair Witch, and you know exactly what I was talking about. But I can't do that anymore because now there's actually a movie called Blair Witch. They fucking ruined it for me. And that movie wasn't even that good, but boy howdy do I digress. Anyway, when they made uh, the Blair Witch Project, when one of the characters is operating the camera, it's actually the actor that's operating the camera. All three of them got some basic training in camera operation and simple outlines of their scenes, and they were basically thrown into the woods and told to improvise. And you know what? It worked. Mostly. It honestly looked like three college students with a camera wandered out into the woods and got themselves killed by some unseen thing. It felt real. Hell, a lot of people legitimately thought it was real. It's kind of silly to think about now, but at the time it was released, a surprising number of moviegoers thought the Blair Witch Project was legit, and Heather, Mike, and Josh really died in those woods. Heather Donahue's mother even received a sympathy card from a distant relative who thought she was actually dead. It was a different time. 
Video quality can also be a problem with found footage movies. Strange though it may sound, sometimes there is such a thing as video quality that's too good. It all depends on the source, of course, or at least what the source is supposed to be. If you're dealing with a documentary film crew or a TV news reporter, it makes sense that the video quality would be relatively high since the camera operator in this case would actually have a professional grade camera. But take this shot from Into the Storm. What we are allegedly watching here was filmed with the selfie camera on this guy's phone. This camera is rock steady, the audio quality is outstanding, and the video looks pristine even in low light. Now, cell phone cameras have come a long way in recent years. Hell, I think they used an iPhone to shoot a scene in one of the Sharknado movies. But they still have their limitations, as you can clearly see here. Now, I'm doing my best to duplicate the shot from Into the Storm using my car and my phone. And my phone has a pretty good camera for a phone. But it can't hold a candle to a professional film camera or even the prosumer grade camera I used to shoot my videos. And this should become even more obvious once I step outside. Yeah, does this look anywhere near as good as that shot from Into the Storm? Hell no. They were not using a cell phone. Chronicle had this problem as well, come to think of it. There's a big fight near the end of the movie between Andrew and Matt, where director Josh Trank all but abandoned the found footage concept entirely. The action is just a little too easy to follow, and the transitions are just a little too smooth. And again, some of this footage was supposedly shot by innocent bystanders on their cell phones. Not buying it. Nor am I buying this one shot from a police dash cam. Lots of people watch cop shows, Josh. We know what dash cam footage looks like. And it doesn't look like this. And then there's George Romero's failed attempt at found footage, Diary of the Dead. One of the mistakes he repeatedly makes with this movie isn't so much with video, but audio quality. Far too often, characters in the movie sound like they're right next to the camera, even though they're clearly far away. Of course, the reason for this is their mic'd, because it never occurred to Romero that people in the real world aren't normally mic'd up 24-7. And Diary of the Dead reminds me of another thing you have to keep in mind when making a found footage movie. The camera operator is also a character. But of course the camera operator is also a character, you might well say. Isn't that obvious? Well, you'd like to think that, wouldn't you? But check out this shot. Jesus, Gordo, look out! This zombie somehow snuck up on the group from behind, which is silly enough, and for reasons that are beyond me, it ignored the dude holding the camera, walked right past him, and went after this guy. What the hell? Well, if the zombie apocalypse ever happens, I know just what I need to do to survive. Hold on to a camera. Because apparently this makes me invisible. So that's how found footage filmmakers tend to forget they're making a found footage film. But those aren't the only mistakes they can make. There are some annoying little tropes that tend to crop up in these movies far too often. And one that really grinds my gears is a little thing that I like to call, put down the camera and help, asshole! You've seen this a million times, I'm sure. Whenever shit starts hitting the fan, the idiot holding the camera has to make sure he gets everything on film because reasons. People around you are dying? Keep filming. Someone or something is about to kill you? Keep filming. You're in a place where you have absolutely no reason to film? Doesn't matter, keep filming. The Paranormal Activity series was notorious for this. I cannot begin to count the number of times in those movies that any normal person would have dropped the fucking camera and either helped out their friends and loved ones or just run the fuck away. Or wouldn't have been filming in the first place. Like that scene in Paranormal Activity 4 where the girl carries her laptop outside for no reason. It almost becomes a joke after a while. And I say this as someone who actually liked the Paranormal Activity movies. Well, the first three. And I know I've really been harping on Diary of the Dead, which feels a little awkward considering George Romero passed away recently, but in Diary of the Dead, there's a moment shortly before the scene where the zombie ignores the cameraman where this girl, played by Michelle Morgan, gets attacked by a zombie. The cameraman is her boyfriend, and how does he react when the zombie attacks his woman? He just stands there and films it. Dick. Sorry, honey, I'd totally like to help you, but I gotta make sure I get all this on tape for posterity. Yeah, yeah, because I'm totally a journalist and whatnot. But don't worry, you got this. 
You show that zombie who's boss. This is one thing I liked about Wreck. There is actually a moment when people near the cameraman are in need of immediate help, and get this, he puts down the camera and helps! Heaven and Earth rejoice! Of course, the camera conveniently lands in a spot where it can continue to film the action, but I can let that go. He put it the hell down. Good enough for me. And technically, Quarantine did this too, but only because it's almost a shot-for-shot -shot remake of Wreck. They get no points for that. And there's one more thing you must keep in mind when making a found footage movie. You must be able to answer the question, how was this footage found? Seems obvious, right? It's called found footage after all. That implies someone found it. So logically, there must have been a way for someone to find it. Only a complete fool wouldn't take that into consideration, right? Well, you would be surprised. Now, this does not mean the movie has to spell out in great detail exactly who found the footage and how. There just needs to be a conceivable explanation. The Blair Witch Project doesn't spell out how the footage was found, but you could easily come up with something. I'll do it right now. Someone went for a hike in the woods, stumbled upon the camera. It's simple, it's plausible, that's enough. And yet, for the life of me, I cannot explain how the footage from Apollo 18 was found. If you've never seen Apollo 18, you're not missing much, but here's the short, short version. There was another Apollo mission that the government covered up because the crew were killed by some sort of rock monsters living on the moon that somehow went undiscovered in the previous six Apollo moon landings. Yeah, it made no goddamn sense. But here's where the movie gets really dumb. The footage mostly consists of the onboard cameras in the command and lunar modules and a handheld camera operated by the astronauts. And all of these cameras are in space and never made it back to Earth. So, how the fuck was this footage found? You can't very well make the case that someone just went for a stroll on the moon one day and oh look, where did this camera come from? I suppose you could argue the onboard footage would be beamed back to Mission Control. Okay, but the handheld? No freaking way. That camera and its tapes never left the surface of the moon. So who the hell found it and how? I have been thinking about this far more than I probably should have, and the most plausible answer I can come up with is... A wizard did it. That's a problem. You know, it occurs to me that I've come up with several different films as examples of what not to do when making a found footage film, but the film I keep coming back to as an example of how to do it correctly is The Blair Witch Project. It seems to be one of those rare films that avoided all of the common found footage problems. It looks and feels authentic, they never stray from the found footage aspect, there's a simple explanation for how the footage was found, and there aren't any put the camera down and help asshole moments. The more I think about it, the more I wonder if the Blair Witch Project was the only one that really got it right. It's not the only good found footage movie, mind you. I don't know if I'd even call it my personal favorite, though it would definitely be in the top five. But if you're looking for a blueprint for how a found footage movie should be done, it seems to be the gold standard. And I really wish filmmakers would take this into consideration when making found footage movies in the future. And I know they're gonna keep making them because, as we've established, profit is all but guaranteed. And honestly, that's perfectly fine. Whether you're working for a big production company or just cutting your teeth with the Asylum or some other indie studio, if you have your heart set on making yet another found footage movie, knock yourself out. But if you're gonna do it, at least try to do it right. Because honestly, these problems are not that difficult to avoid. I'm really not asking anything more than the minimum amount of effort. And if that's too much to ask, maybe found footage isn't your thing. Well, thank you for indulging me with today's experiment. Next time, we shall return to our regularly scheduled bullshit. And it's December, which means it's time for another Christmas movie! Yay. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.
I'm trying to film a scene for this friggin' found footage video, and a cat just jumped on the hood of my car and started meowing at me. I can't get a moment's peace. It's like, all the things that could possibly go wrong, you never expect a fucking cat to just come up and start going, meow, meow, meow. 